Last week, we kind of restarted a series that we're in for the rest of the year until Christmas time called Reflect. Uh, and last week, we really looked at this idea of the image of God, that every person, every man, woman, and child on this earth has intrinsically weaved into their DNA value bestowed upon them by God himself. Above all other kinds of creation, you and you alone are the only one who carry the image of God with you. And as a result of that, this ability to connect with God is present. To really kind of slow down, especially in a world that's so fast-paced, to really be able to just slow down and think about, ponder on, or perhaps reflect on who God is. We serve a generous and good God. And my fear is so often that we just kind of like, uh, uh, you know, kind of like speak in Christianese and say some things that we've heard for a long time and then very quickly move on. And so part of my hope this, this series is that we will, as a community, like just breathe for a second and slow down and reflect on how generous our God is. But then the other part of this notion of being made in the image of God is as a result, we have this ability to reflect whose image we've been made towards our community. And we do that in lots of fun ways. Listen, cards on the table. We want to host a great trunk or treat at the fall festival because we want to proclaim to the city of Meadows Place a God who values community, a God who created laughter and joy, a God who created most candy except for that candy corn. That stuff, there's no way. That stuff is nasty. It's not from God. But most candy from... I just, okay, I lost like half of you there. Candy corn fans, really? What? <laughs> if I like, if I was like, Jesus is coming back, I would have gotten this. But candy corn, woo! Okay, good to know. I'll keep, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to file that away. Candy corn fans. Uh, we want to reflect who our God is, both within the community, within the church, and then outside of it as well. Who, who would want to take this generous God who's loving and full of grace and mercy and shows compassion and then hoard it for themselves? And so as those made in the image of God, we have this opportunity to reflect who he is. And so for the next several pairings of weeks, we will do kind of an A-B thing where we'll reflect on how God has been generous towards us. And then the following week, we'll take that same characteristic and say, so what would that look like within our community? How could we then reflect that? And this morning, it's on this idea of a generous pursuit. Just to remind you of a quote we read last week on what it means to be made in the image of God. Here's a quote that we read. To be an image of God, it's not just about the fact that a close connection is present. It also implies that the image shows something about what it images. The basic idea here is that God has a likeness image and God has created people with that in view. It's a standard for what, for what God intends humanity ultimately to be. It is the goal towards which humanity is to develop. But as the New Testament clarifies, sin prevents people from developing as God intends. In fact, it damages people so badly they are much farther from God's standard after their fall into sin than before it. And we, we looked at this beautiful picture in Genesis 1 of a God who creates everything and says it's good, including man and woman. And they have peace between them. They have peace with creation. They have peace with God. And then sin, it, it, it interrupts this peace. It breaks this peace. And it takes what God has created it takes the abilities that God has given man and woman and it runs them away from their creator. It runs them away from the one in whose image they have been made. Now hang on to that image for a second. And we, we already determined there are some candy corn fans and not some candy corn fans. There, uh, there are also two kinds of people in this world. 
There are the kind of people in this world who um, really like stuff. And I don't mean like materialistic. I'm not trying to judge you or anything. I mean like, like you like to arrange things in your house and you like really value collections. And like, you know, there's 10 of these things in this collection set and you have nine of them and you're excited about getting the 10th one. And then there's person two who approaches person one and says, can I see your collection? Oh, this is beautiful. And then throws it in the trash because stuff is ultimately meant to be thrown away. Are you a person one or person two? In fact, turn to your neighbor and just ask them, are you person one or person two? Do you like, are you like a stuff person, a hoarder? That'd be, that's, that's mean. Don't ask them if they're a hoarder. But, or are you like a person like loves to throw stuff away? Just throw it away. You're all alone. Which one, person one or two? Two? Oh, both? You're a both and? That's okay. All right, good. Um, now listen, one of our core values here at Sugar Grove Church of Christ is we believe that uh, we serve a God who's into the business of transformation. He transforms hearts. His grace is so good that he loves you exactly where you are, but his grace is also so good that it compels you to move on from where you are into better things. And so I stand before you a former person one whose heart has been transformed in the way it should be, which is to be a person two. Throw stuff away. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day, and it reminded me of a comedy bit that Jerry Seinfeld did on the Jimmy Fallon show. He is a person two, and he is married to a person one. And he, he joked about his ideal store. If he could create a store, it would be you go in, you kind of look around, you decide what you're going to buy, you purchase it, and then you turn around and just throw it away. And then you walk out a happy customer. And so then he kind of goes on in this bit and begins to tell, like, talk about where your stuff is in your house is really kind of how much you value it. In fact, I'll just let you guys watch this. Take, take a look at this clip. Objects start, start the, the highest level, level visible, visible in, in the living, living area. area. From, From there, it goes, goes down, down to a closet, closet cupboard, cupboard or drawer. drawer. That's, That's why, why we, we have those. those. So, so we don't, don't have, have to see all of the huge mistakes, mistakes we've made. made. Yeah. From the, the closet, closet it goes, goes to the garage, garage. One, one of the longest phases in trashification. <laughs> but the most, most definite. definite. No, no object, object has ever made it out of the garage and back, back into, into the, the house. house. The, the word, word garage seems, seems to be a form of the word garage. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Once, Once you're living in, in the, the same room as the garbage, garbage cans, well... It, it won't, won't be, be much, much longer, longer now. <laughs> really, eBay, eBay is, is the, the only, only thing, thing that can save the object at this point. point. eBay, another, another great step forward in human culture. Hey, why don't, don't we mail our garbage back and forth to each other? <laughs> why, why talk, talk to your, your family, family at night, night when you, you could be bidding eight to ten dollars on a troll doll from, from Thailand? Thailand. <laughs> Or, or a, a personal, personal store unit. unit. This, this is, is the saddest, saddest of all. <laughs> now, now, instead, instead of, of free garbage, garbage you, you pay, pay rent to visit, visit your garbage. garbage. <laughs> everything's, everything's locked up, everything's, everything's rusted and broken, you, you gotta bust, bust into, into that lock, lock you, you lift, lift up, up that rolling steel, steel door. door. Look, look, I'm, I'm trying, trying to get, get you guys out of here, here okay? <laughs> there's no place for you in the world. I'm looking, I'm working on it. I will be, be back, back to, to see you, you again, again soon. soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I love Seinfeld. He's, he's hilarious. Uh, now, I, I, listen, he, he's, he's right on, but I think it actually even gets worse than that because stuff in a storage unit is, like he said, like hidden behind a steel door, hidden behind a lock. You got to have a keypad even just to get into, to go see this place. There's security cameras everywhere, and there is a place where stuff collects even more dust under no security. If it's your stuff, you call it the junk drawer. Do you have a junk drawer in your house? Do you have two or three or four junk drawers in your house? And if it's not your stuff, we call it the lost and found. 
Have you seen these lost and found boxes? They are under no security. They are under no watchful eye. Why? Because we all know that the stuff in there has no value whatsoever. It's something that someone did not remember they were forgetting. And then when they did remember, if they have it all, it was too far removed from losing it that they thought, I just don't have the time to go back and get it. In fact, most lost and found boxes have some kind of fine print on it that's like after 30 days or at the end of the month or at the end of the year, we will throw away everything in the lost and found because not only does it not have any value, not only is it not wanted, we don't want it either. We've looked around, we know eBay exists, and we've decided the trash is the best place for the lost and found items in this box. Uh, this word lost, we kind of know it to be true. This, it carries this idea of unwanted, unloved, unclaimed. Or even if you take the word lost and you, you like use it in a sense of direction, we don't really like to use that word either because then you just feel stupid. You have to say to someone, if you're saying that you're lost, I'm on the world and I need to go somewhere. I don't know how to get there. Could you help? And no one likes to ask for help and no one really likes to admit that they don't know where they're going. And so this term lost, this idea of lost carries with it some weighty things. And if you think about Back to the quote that we read a little while ago, if I said to you that sin pulls us away from God, if sin pulls us away from his design for those who have been made in the image of God, you understand a little bit why we sometimes use this word to describe people who do not yet know Christ, that they are lost. Or if you hear someone's testimony, they would say they are lost. And my fear is that we take the, the notion of unwanted and unloved and stupid and forgotten and attach those adjectives about lost to people who are lost. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I have the great privilege of just reading out of Luke 15 this beautiful, beautiful three-word simple truth about our God. Lost means loved. Lost means means loved. It does not mean unwanted. It does not mean unclaimed. It means loved, for we have a God who generously pursues those who are lost. And so I'd like for us to read about that this morning in Luke 15. So if you turned there a little while ago, very good. We're going to start at the very beginning of Luke 15. And here's what I told you you're going to have to read this morning. If Whoever you talk to uh, about if you're person one or person two, I want you guys to group up again and read these verses on the screen. Or if you got your translation, you can read it. But all throughout the room, everybody read these first couple of verses in Luke chapter 15. Ready, go. All right, very good. I, I heard some reading. Again, candy corn. Woo! Read this. And the tribes and the Pharisees, they're approaching, and it was quiet. All right, now there are two groups present, correct? Did you guys get that when we read? There are tax collectors and sinners, and we would describe these as the lost, right? You got tax collectors, those who are on behalf of the government that is oppressing your people, collecting your money to further support the oppression of your people. And then we've got sinners. These are lost, unwanted, unloved, unclaimed, nobody wants to do with them people. And then we have another group of people present with us this morning. We have the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious people. And what are they doing? They're complaining. I know that's a shock. Sometimes religious people complain. I know. I know. We would know. We don't know what that's like, but apparently back in the day, they complained all the time. So the religious people are complaining, and they're complaining because this man, and if you read ahead or if you know Luke 15, we're talking about Jesus. They're complaining because Jesus is welcoming not the Pharisees and the scribes, but the first group. Jesus is welcoming and eating with the unlovable, unclaimed, unwanted Tax collectors and sinners and the religious people have nothing to do with it. 
Why? Because Jesus has showed up saying that he is the son of God. Jesus has showed up saying, you want to know what God looks like? I am the image of God. I haven't been made in the image of God. I am the image of God. And the religious people are going, no. God certainly wouldn't welcome the tax collectors and sinners. God would welcome the religious right people. And so if you're welcoming them, you must be wrong. And so they begin to complain. And as a result of these complaints, Jesus tells three stories back to back to back. We call these things parables. And oftentimes parables are kind of like, oh, they're really nice stories with a nice moral, at, moral of the story at the end. No, these are pointed statements at those who are complaining. So let's get to our first uh, parable that Jesus tells. Jesus tells this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together saying to them, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep." Now, the Pharisees and the scribes, they would beat all of us in Bible verse memorization. These guys know their Bibles left and right, inside and out. And Jesus opens with a story about a man who has sheep. We would call this person a a shepherd. Jesus opens with a story about a shepherd with guys present who know the Bible inside and out. And in Ezekiel 34, which... Bobby already knew. Bobby's already opened Ezekiel 34 because she's got the Bible that memorized too. But for the rest of us, here's Ezekiel 34. Listen to what God says about himself. See, I myself will search for my flock and look for them. As a shepherd looks for his sheep on the day he is among his scattered flock, so I, God, will look for my flock. And I'm going to rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and total darkness. I'm going to bring them out from the peoples. I'm going to gather them. I'm going to tend to my flock and let them lie down. This is the declaration of the Lord God. I will seek the lost, God says. I will bring back the strays, bandage the injured, and strengthen the weak. So this idea of a shepherd who's lost a sheep, is not necessarily a new one. And I wonder if the scribes and Pharisees are already starting to think about Ezekiel 34. And then we can cheat a little bit because we know in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the God who seeks lost sheep and finds it. And so it's no surprise this morning that as we get into this parable, he tells us of a a man who has a hundred sheep, and 99 are there. He's, they're counting the sheep at the end of the day. 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. And then there's no more sheep. He's lost his sheep. And so what does he do? He counts another time because he's particular and thorough. Still 99. And so he goes and looks for the sheep. You guys read this again. Everybody re- re- get back in your circles. I told you participation this morning. Read again. I'm going to go look for the sheep. Read, read, read again. I'm looking for sheep over here. No. Hi, looking for sheep. Looking for sheep. Have you seen any sheep? No. No. Okay, I have a question. How, it says that he's going to search for the sheep until something happens. What happens? Until he finds it. So he's not going to stop until he does what? He's not going to be, could this, could this good shepherd be deterred? Could this good shepherd be distracted by his mission? No, he's going to keep searching until what? He finds it. He's going to keep searching high and low. No matter how tired he may be, he's going to keep searching until he, until he, finds, until he finds it. Someone moved my prop. This is awkward. <laughs> pretend, pretend, I pretend I found a sheep. It's a really cute sheep and it's got a, oh, it's over there. 
in the next service we'll do better. <laughs> Pretend someone, and then he finds his sheep with a pink tutu on it. I asked, I was going to like search out for a real sheep, and then I asked Matt, like, how much do sheep weigh? And he was like, oh, like 150 pounds. And I was like, yeah, this one will do just, this one will do just fine. Now, so the shepherd is going to keep searching until he finds the, the one that, it, it, and this is a good sheep or a bad sheep? It's a, it's a lost sheep. It's not where the sheep is supposed to be. He is going to keep searching until he finds it. And I told you earlier that Jesus said he's the what kind of shepherd? He's a good kind of shepherd. Could you imagine if he was like the teaching kind of shepherd? Here's what would have happened. He would have found the sheep by Ami. He'd have been like, oh, you really messed up. Sheep, you're supposed to be over there. See, you're supposed to stay with the flock. And, you're supposed to, and then the shepherd would just start to teach the sheep how a sheep is supposed to act. Or, or maybe, like, could you imagine if it was like the coaching shepherd? He's like, here, sheep, I'm going to give you this playbook. I'm going to give you these rules and how you're supposed to do it. And then you, like, follow those rules. And then you'll be exactly where you're supposed to be. Or what if it was like the indifferent shepherd it was like or like kind of like too busy shepherd and he kind of like sees the sheep and it's like oh I don't have time for this hey this it's you go over there I, I'm, I'm a little too busy for you what if it's like the parenting shepherd parents in the room you know you know kids aren't where they're supposed to be how many times have I told you not to go you're not supposed to be over there shame on you spanking and then you drag the kid I mean sheep into where they're supposed to be but it's not the indifferent shepherd it's not the busy shepherd it's not the teaching shepherd what if it was like the activist shepherd we're really good at this kind of shepherding in 2017 there are sheep out there who are lost. Let's start a hashtag. Hashtag lost sheep go home. <laughs> oh, this is bad. I wish this wouldn't have popped in my head, but it did. Hashtag bad sheep. <laughs> and let's get like a, like a picket sign and let's start picketing the bad sheep that are lost. Return home sheep. Return home sheep. Is that the shepherd that shows up? No, it's the good shepherd. And why is it really, really good news that it's the good shepherd? Because the teaching shepherd and the coaching shepherd, the activist shepherd, the, the indifferent and busy shepherd, all these shepherds, it's on the sheep to get back home. It's all of them saying, it's on you, you go. It's up to you, you go. And the sheep will never get where it's supposed to. The sheep is in need of a good shepherd with a steady hand who reaches out and grabs the 150 pound sheep with the pink tutu and puts it on its shoulders and walks it back home. We are in desperate need of a good shepherd who puts us on his shoulders and walks us back home because we're incapable of getting there on our own. And did you notice how the shepherd walks back? What, is, what has he got on his face? He's got like a smile on his face. He's filled with joy and immediately he's home immediately he's home. I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon. Listen to what he has to say about the hand of our shepherd. When the divine hand, which fixed the foundations of the earth, had fixed itself on me, my wanderings were ended once for all. He is the good shepherd who does not start to teach or coach or condemn or picket sign or you got that no he reaches down by his strong hand he grabs you puts you on his shoulders because he's gonna walk you back home and when he does this filled with joy he tells all his friends, they throw a party, they rejoice, and then Jesus follows it up with this statement. I tell you, in the same way, 
There's going to be even more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Have you ever been in like a big crowd where like rejoicing takes place? Have you ever been in like a big crowd where like they just start cheering and then cheering even more and then standing ovation and they just go crazy? It changes the atmosphere. Like it's tangible. You can like feel it. And Jesus says there's the shepherd who lost his sheep. He goes and finds it because he knows exactly where to look for the sheep. He reaches out by his strong and good hand. He puts the sheep on his shoulder. He throws a party. They celebrate. And that party ain't got nothing on what's going on in heaven when a sinner repents. A gracious God who pursues. So he continues. He tells another parable. Read this parable with your friends. Read this parable with your friends. So we've gone from one to a hundred, one out of a hundred to one out of ten. It's now no longer a man looking for a sheep. It's a woman looking for a coin. She loses the coin in the dusty floor, and so she lights a lamp. This could be because it's nighttime. This could be because there weren't a lot of windows in houses back then, and so it's dark. And so she gets a lamp, and she starts to sweep, and she's going to keep sweeping the house. She's going to keep searching. She's not just going to kind of like half-heartedly do it. She is carefully looking with lamp And sweeper in hand, that's a word. And he's carefully looking for the lost coin. Have you ever lost like a penny? Have you ever like had a penny fall out of your pocket and you've literally thought like the energy to bend over and pick up the penny, not even worth it. And so you just kind of keep on walking. Have you ever lost an Apple TV remote? I have. You know what you do? You Google how expensive Apple TV remotes are. You very quickly realize that's insane. $70. I'll tell you. Don't ever lose an Apple TV remote. 70 bucks for a remote. And so you light a lamp. You grab a sweeper. And you very carefully look. You turn over furniture. You look everywhere. Because that thing, that TV remote has got a ton of value. Jesus tells a story of a woman who carefully looks for a coin because that coin has got some serious value to her. This notion that lost is unwanted, unloved, unclaimed out the window. The shepherd looks for the lost sheep and now this woman looks for a coin that is so valued. Jesus is telling this story to sinners and religious people alike. And so we get to a third parable, a parable that many of you have probably heard before. Uh, even if you, this is like the first time you've ever gone to church this morning, it's a parable of two sons and a dad. And I'll just kind of paint the picture for you. One's the younger son insults the father beyond belief by asking for his inheritance before his dad's dead. Dad, you're better off to me dead, so just give me the money that I would get when you die so that I can go live my life the way I want to live. And the son willingly leaves the father's house. He goes and blows all his money on inappropriate and not very good things. He finds himself uh, the lowest of lows, eating eating with animals that he's not allowed to touch or he'll be unclean, and he has this idea— I know I'll go back to my dad and I'll ask him if I can like work for him because the people who work for him are better off than me. So he plans this speech of repentance to go back to his dad. And then the story goes that as he's approaching the dad's house, it turns out that the dad has been looking for him. The son has left the kingdom, insulted his dad, and yet the dad's sitting like on the porch step. I don't know if there's a porch step, but a porch, it's a story. So sure, a porch step, looking out, looking for the son. Now, according to the way the younger son has planned this, he's going to make it all the way up to the steps and then very like 
carefully just apologized to the dad. And the story goes that the dad runs out into the world to meet his son where he is. The son has this speech, and he has a speech plan, and he gets about halfway through before the dad interrupts him, arms around him, kisses him, and welcomes him in back into the community. And yet again, a party is thrown. Because in heaven, when one who is lost is found, when one who is lost repents, there is great joy and celebration over this because the lost is valued. The lost is claimed and lost means love for the generous God that we serve. If you have your Bible, go now to Luke chapter 19. Jesus is done telling these stories, and he's just kind of walking through the crowd. He's told this story of a shepherd. He's told this story of a woman who's lost his coin. He's told the story of a dad who lost a son, And then in Luke chapter 19, we see that he's walking, and there's this man named Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector. So he's like the head honcho of the tax collectors, which we do not like, and we would describe as lost. And he's in charge of them all, so we dislike Zacchaeus all the more. Some of you guys, I heard you. When I said Zacchaeus, I heard you saying he was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he... He was trying to see who Jesus was, this chief tax collector, this lost, unlovable, unlikable, unclaimed, want nothing to do with him, wants to see who Jesus is. But he's a a small man. So running ahead, he climbs up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since Jesus is about to pass him by. Except Jesus sees Zacchaeus. The shepherd sees the sheep. The woman sees the coin, the daddy sees the son, and now Jesus sees Zacchaeus. He says, hurry and come down, because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. So very quickly, this chief tax collector climbs down the tree and welcomed him joyfully. And all who saw it apparently didn't get the picture after the three stories. Good news. Sometimes you just don't see it after the three stories. It's it's okay. But apparently they didn't see it because they began to complain yet again. And it's the same complaint. This Jesus is hanging out with the wrong kind of people. This Jesus is hanging out with the lost. And he should be hanging out with the religious right. What is wrong with this Jesus? They haven't yet gotten that Jesus flips the whole thing upside down. But... Zacchaeus stood there and says to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor, Lord. And if I uh, extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much, which is way more than he had to. Today, Jesus says, salvation, freedom from sin. Today, salvation has come to this house, Jesus says, because he too is a son of Abraham And then read with your neighbor this last line that Jesus, the good shepherd, Jesus, the true and better old woman, Jesus, the true and better dad says. Read that line with your friends. He has come to go find the sheep. His whole purpose here is to find the coin. His whole purpose here is to welcome the lost son back in. He is so generous in his pursuit of you and me. My prayer this morning has been that if you are a Christian, if you know this Jesus, then these stories of a lost sheep and a lost coin and a lost son would remind you of the God that pursued you. And if this morning you do not yet know the Jesus whose steady hand reaches out and puts you on his shoulders and walks you home, my prayer has been that God would reveal that to you, that your heart would know that, that you would see that in a brand new way this morning. 
May we all see the Son of Man who came to seek and save the lost.